We need to be able to move people. We need to be able to create jobs. We need to be able to strengthen communities. A penny sales tax hike for transportation. It is on the ballot in Broward. The mayor and a top county administrator are here to make their pitch. He's had it too easy for too long without a, a tough challenger. I talk about my record of getting things done. A fight to flip. A first-time candidate is running to beat veteran GOP Congressman Mario diaz Ballard. Democrat Mary Barzi Flores is with us live. Hurricane Michael is the worst storm that the Florida Panhandle has ever seen. People are going to need housing. They're going to need food. Hurricane politics. North Florida suffers. And the Senate candidates are there to help and also get some TV face time. We will take that to the roundtable. Good morning. Great to be with you. As always, we keep the focus on your November ballot today, and we begin with a big decision about raising the sales tax. In Broward, voters will say yay or nay to raising the county sales tax by a penny from six to seven cents to pay for transportation improvements for years to come. Raising the sales tax in Broward by a penny would bring in about $300 million a year. Money supporters say would be used to upgrade roads and bridges, install new traffic signals, put in fiber optic lines, buy new electric buses, maybe at some point down the line, even build a light rail system. Broward Mayor Beam Fur joins us. He is leading the support of that sales tax hike. And Gretchen Cassini is Assistant County Administrator in Broward, tasked with getting voters to approve what's called the Penny for Transportation. Welcome both. Thank so you. nice Good to have morning. you here. You? And you since there, there is no uh, opposition here, that's going to have to be us a little <laughs> bit. So, that's um, okay. so Mayor, please set up why, why you think this is needed. And there's, there's a lot of questions, but, but take the headline. Well, I will tell you, as a, as a county commissioner, I get more questions on transportation than any other by far. Every single day in my office, somebody's calling me, asking, um, you know, there's either a concern about paratransit or the bus, or, you know, how, you know, they get stuck on I-95, or they get stuck on US-1, or, so it's constant. It is absolutely constant. And they're asking, they're looking to the county commission to come up with a plan to relieve them of, of all the time they're spending in the car. They want to spend more time with their family. They don't want to be spending, you know, every other minute of their day in the, in the, in traffic. All right, so traffic is, Ms. Cassini, a huge problem in Broward, all over South Florida. But some people would say, what is your plan? Give me the specifics. What is this extra penny, this $300 million a year for the next 30 years, what's it going to provide? Well, there's a very detailed plan, and um, it was actually developed over the last five years to include fiber optics across the entire county. So we have some fiber optics that have been laid on the eastern Why part. is this important? What's, what's it, the big deal about fiber optics? That is the backbone for being able to do uh, adaptive signal control. And in a lay, layperson's terms, that means being able to, in real time, change traffic lights to adapt to congestion. Um, when we have a situation where an ambulance preempts a light, all of those things have to be handled through real-time fiber optics. And without the fiber yeah. optic network in the ground, we're not really able to do that effectively. So that's one of, on, on the plan, and it's mm -hmm. on the website, anyone right. can go on it and read what you have. There's 700 and some odd, 709 projects. City projects. Those are, yeah, just okay, city. city projects. Those are city projects. So it, what it looks like, Miami-Dade just, just passed, um, it is, has a smart plan that mm -hmm. is really controversial because it goes back to the raising of Miami-Dade sales tax mm -hmm. that 20 years ago, 20 years ago right. that promised rail and right. now it's going to be bus and you know no disrespect to buses but it's not what the voters voted for so here comes Broward right. you're sort of in the shadow of this very long controversial disingenuous in some parts process and so you have this plan. How are people going to be sure that the 30 years that goes by, this is what you're going to deliver? This is actually the very first referendum in the state of Florida that had to be audited before it went to the ballot. People don't know this. The, the state legislature required us to have the entire plan audited uh, before we could put it on the ballot. So this entire, and Gretchen has been a big part of this, she's spent, I think, the last four months with the auditors. So every line by line, had to be looked at, had to make sure it was economically feasible, had to make sure that the projects were doable, and if it didn't, if that didn't pass, 
then they would have had findings and we wouldn't be able to go to ballot. But, but I guess the, okay, so audit, the auditors say this is doable, but how do, how do voters know that in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you're going to be doing it? Where, where is the, is it a promise? Is there a commitment? Is there an oversight to this? Well, not only is there an oversight committee yeah. that was created in response to some of the concerns that were brought forth in the last initiative in 2016, uh, in order to try to take politics out of it. But we've looked at um, all of the other areas in the country, including Miami-Dade, and we've tried to learn from those referenda so that we are able not only to be able to provide a very specific plan, but also a plan that allows us to be flexible in the future and to adapt to changing conditions and technologies as they come to market. All right, well, here is sort of the 800-pound gorilla in the room this morning. <laughs> yeah. Here is the... Uh, Sun Sentinel editorial page, and you both have seen it, and Beam Fur, you know, the headline says, woke up reject, <laughs> yep, yeah. unhappily, reject Broward right. Penny Tax Slush Fund, trust us, mm. transportation plan is full of holes, and it says that this plan that you propose here is squishy. A, pi a pipe dream, too. Mm. A pipe I don't, dream. I don't, I, I would disagree. I think there's, there, we actually, if you look at our plan, you'll see exactly which intersections we intend to re-engineer. You'll see exactly where the fiber optics are going. You see the 45 miles that we're going to be of roads we're going to be widening. You see all the sidewalks, all the safety zones. It is a 30-year spreadsheet, so the, it is yeah. very detailed. Now, right. well, let, let, excuse me. Let okay. me ask you about one part of this. Uh, there is kind of a vague promise. Maybe down the road at some point we will build that wave light rail system, which right. has only been talked about. Oh my goodness, 25 years, something right. like that. Right. And the Fort Lauderdale City Commission recently said, we're not going there anymore. We don't want it. Mm -hmm. So how, how, what is the future and the, and of the, a $4 billion light rail system? Well, we, first of all, we need that kind of capacity. But it, that plan had been in the 2035 MPO plan. Mm -hmm. It had been in the 2040 Metropolitan MPO plan. Planning Met Organization. Thank you. Thank you for that. And they never saw the light of day because there, were, there was no dedicated funding for it. So those, those plans have been there to, do, to provide uh, light rail in, in Broward County. But without a de dedicated stream of funding, it will never, it will never be seen. So mm -hmm. what we've done this time is we've built a coalition. We've built a really good coalition of all the cities, the MPO, FDOT, the county. Is, we've plan, all, is the city of Plantation in on this? Because this they, line would go through They plantation. have signed the interlocal agreement. Now, l l let me finish. They, we have decided together to plan this. So the 2045 plan, we're going to all work on this together. Whether or not it goes through plantation or wherever it goes, we're all going to be in it together. And, that, and part of, we've all signed an interlocal agreement to figure out to, to prioritize, to rank it, to value those different things, and to decide where this is going to go. That's, and okay. I think that's important. You it, know, it's, a, um, it's a different approach. The uh, Broward County vo uh, voters voted on a school tax to yes. do some infrastructure work, mm -hmm. and, and that was, it's been a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Projects are in the works. There are 17 projects that have been awarded. So recently I saw this report and the chart that those projects have, from the time they were bonded and, and maybe went through mm -hmm. an audit committee, have increased in the prices, the costs of those projects have increased 52 percent. Wow. That's really significant. Mm -hmm. So ha is that baked in now? Is, uh, is that a lesson learned? Is this baked into the cost of a 30-year project? Well, 700 projects? How do you monitor that the cost of living isn't going to make some of the projects mm -hmm. that now look good on paper undoable because they'd be too, too expensive? We talked about cost feasibility uh, when we met with the um, cities, when we talked to FDOT, when we talked to the cities and the MPO. We talked about delivery methods to try to ensure efficiency of these projects. And we also had um, independent transportation experts from across the nation come in and analyze the plan and evaluate whether or not we had an, enough money in these projects escalated over time to be able to deliver what it is that we intend mm -hmm. to deliver to the public. Yeah, uh, Mayor, for a lot of these kind of long-range plans have a built-in sunset period where voters get to go back five, ten years and say, okay, go ahead with it. I mean, the Children's right. Trust Miami-Dade has that kind of a safeguard in it. Why isn't there that kind of a safeguard in this? Because when you actually apply and when you try to leverage federal funds, 
what they require, and it's called, it's called MAP 21, and I do not know what MAP stands for. <laughs> um, but when you try to fe leverage federal funds, they require, let's say if you're building a bus facility. A long-term commitment? A long-term commitment for maintenance and operations. Mm -hmm. You have to prove and show that you can provide the maintenance and the operations for the life of the facility that you're building. If you're building a, a light rail system, if you're building a, a bus facility or whatever you're doing, they will not give you the money. If you don't, if you can't show that, so okay. that is why you have to do. I know, I know. There's been arguments, <clears throat> and I think the Sun Sentinel in particular said, "Why don't you do a 10-year plan?" They don't understand that you can't. We couldn't do any a lot. We couldn't. We're trying to complete the entire grid. Transportation's a very long-term. It project. is long-term. It's yeah. not. It's not yeah. short-term thinking. We for we got you. And Cassini, right. so great to have you both. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you Thank for you so coming. Much. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. All right, up next, the race for Congress in South Florida's 25th Congressional District, the one that stretches from West Miami-Dade over to nearly Naples. The Democratic candidate, Mary Barzi Flores, is with us next. The race for Congress in South Florida's 25th Congressional District has become one of the most contentious on the ballot here. And one of the congressional races garnering national attention also. The district stretches from West Miami-Dade across the Everglades into Collier and Hendry counties. In public, uh, incumbent Republican Congressman Mario diaz Ballard has represented this district since 2006, a majority Hispanic and conservative population that went for President Trump, though only by 2% in 2016. Diaz Ballard has powerful input on federal spending, is proud of his ability to bring it home to South Florida, as well as his record on affordable housing, Everglades restoration, tax cuts, and his work for immigration reform. Mary Barzi Flores is his Democratic challenger. She is a lawyer and has served as a state court judge and was nominated to be a federal judge. Before that, she was a federal public defender. Here with us today, so great to have you. Good morning, we are glad you were here, and we regret we want to put on the record the Congressman Diaz Ballert, we proposed several dates to have a debate here on this week in South Florida, uh, and he simply didn't agree to it. Uh, we regret that. We're glad you're here. So, Thank you. first question is He is a veteran member of Congress. 
Congress works on seniority, and he has seniority and the power that goes with it. You would be a freshman without any seniority and, frankly, without much power. So why should voters send you to uh, Washington? Well, uh, many reasons. The first reason being that I intend and will actually fight for and represent the people in this community. And seniority is great, but uh, you've got to use it uh, to good. And, and, and he has not been. How, and I give will. us some specifics. How has he not represented the people of this district? All right, where do I begin? Uh, let's start with health care. So um, I hear day in and day out, whether I, on both sides of Alligator Alley, frankly. So whether I'm in Northwest Dade or I'm in Collier or I'm in Hendry, I hear people concerned about health care. Um, they're, they're concerned if they're on Medicare that their Medicare is going to be cut. Uh, they're concerned if they're on the Affordable Care Act um, exchanges that the Affordable Care Act is going to be repealed without replacement. Um, they're concerned that they could be one health crisis away from personal bankruptcy. And Mario diaz Bilar, my opponent, has 18 times voted uh, to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which would have resulted in close to 300,000 people including those with pre-existing conditions, losing access to health care in Florida's District 25 alone. You know, we hear this from every candidate in every race in South Florida. This is huge. And we hear this argument. But the question is, what do you do instead? And because health care is such a complicated, many faceted, many layers of problems. So as a congresswoman, what do you do to fix that understanding that there are a, a majority of conservative lawmakers who don't want what is now. You know, the first thing we've got to do, uh, I believe in, in health care that is truly universal and affordable for every single person living in this country. So med it, Medicare it, for all. Medicare for all, a single payer system? Look, there are probably lots of different ways to get there and however we get there is, is less, in, what we call it is less important than the fact that we need to get there. Certainly, even under the Affordable Care Act, um, there are issues that need to be fixed, right? Premiums are too high, deductibles are too high, the cost of prescription drugs are too high. But these, these things are difficult and it's complicated, but it's not rocket science. Um, you just have to have political yeah. will. Yeah, uh, Ms. Marcy Flores, there is an ad that Congressman diaz Ballard is running now. His wife, who's a lovely person, Tia diaz Ballard, says, we believe in, in health care for everyone, and we believe there should be coverage for pre-existing conditions. Now, does that square, do you think, with his voting record? It doesn't square with his voting record. I don't know what's in his heart, uh, but his voting record is is the evidence that we as Americans have to to what he believes. And um, and I understand uh, Dia is a lovely woman, she and is. I understand she has a, a pre-existing condition. And of course, I hope the best for her. Um, but I hope the best for everybody with a pre-existing condition. And the Diaz Ballards have have access to to first-rate health care and likely always will be able to afford access to first-rate health care. So I'm concerned not just for the Diaz in the world, but for everyone who has got a pre-existing condition. And if any of those bills that he voted for to repeal the Affordable Care Act had ever passed and, may, and, had, and come into law, it would have resulted in tens of millions of Americans losing their access to health care. You know, this week, the congressman was in South Florida this week. Uh, we connected with him for just a little while. He had a commitment this morning, could not be here. Uh, I'd like to play for you a little clip of sound because I asked him, you know, you were, you're going to be here. What is it that, you know, you are proud of as a congressman? And here's what he had to say. I talk about my record. I talk about my record of getting things done. The fact that I have bipartisan support on specific issues, the fact that I have delivered billions upon billions upon billions of dollars contrast between somebody who like me who gets things done who works in a bipartisan way versus an opponent who you know talked about her number one issue being impeachment who's talked about her number one issue being hyperpartisan so that's a that's a reference to you are backed by democrats aching to turn congress blue um, but as far as hyperpartisanship goes in this district 
are, are you hyper-partisan? This is a pretty mixed district. Yeah, I don't have any idea where he gets that thought. Um, and I can tell you I've got bipartisan support already. Um, I did as a nominee to the federal bench. I had wide bipartisan support from the community. And uh, it, you, in, you can look at my uh, donors. I've got Republicans supporting me. I've got independents supporting me. And of course, I have Democrats. Now, do the Democrats want to take back the House in November? Absolutely so. But you know what? So do a lot of independents and even some Republicans, because that's where we see checks and balances. You know, it's interesting to listen to him talk about what he thinks your issues are. Uh, I've heard you speak elsewhere, and I've heard you speak almost solely about health care, which we just uh, covered, and gun violence. And you're, you're backed by several of the Parkland families for your stance on gun violence, um, banning assault weapons. That, that's a tough a tough road to hoe in this Congress. How do you, sort of the same question, how do you take what you believe should happen in gun control, which is a dangerous word to use in a Republican Congress, and how do you make it happen? How, how do you get it done? Look, there is wide bipartisan support for certain common sense gun safety reforms in this country. And I'm not talking about bipartisan in Congress. I'm talking bipartisan American uh, in the voting public. So like, let's look at an issue like universal background checks that my opponent has voted against. 80, 90% of Americans agree. That's not 80 or 90% of Democrats. That's 80, 90% of Americans. So my opponent is obviously beholden to the gun lobby, biggest recipient of NRA money, of all the Congress people in all the state of Florida in the but last 20 years. He's reported it legally. He's gotten, left, the last figure I saw was $29,000 from the NRA. It's a legal contribution and he's reported it. Do you think he's beholden to the NRA? Look, when you, when you look at contributions and then you look at voting record, that's, that's, the, that's the line I'm drawing between the cause and the effect. And this guy took money even from the NRA after the Parkland massacre. That's insulting to this community and, and is disqualifying in my I, view. I'm going to have to stop you there. We're glad you came in. Wish that uh, the congressman had been here. We would have devoted a lot more time, but I'm glad that you came in. Thanks very much, Ms. Parsi Flores. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Up next, we take the big topics of the, re of the week to the round table. <laughs> we <tuned>. will. <laughs>
have a lot to talk about this week with our roundtable. When do we not? <laughs> so let's get right to it. All right. First, we need to tell you who is with us. A bunch of all-stars this morning. H.T. Smith is a veteran Miami attorney, civil rights leader, and a law professor. Anthony Mann, Tony to his friends, is a veteran political reporter for the Sun Sentinel. And Ed Pozzoli is president of the Law of the Trip Scott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale and a big voice in Republican Party politics. To all of you, good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. Great, great to have you come in. All right, so um, Ed Pozzoli, let me ask you, um, the politics, storm politics, hurricane politics, the dynamic of the Senate race, the governor's race, really has changed because of this terrible tragedy in the panhandle. Sort of lay it out for us. Who benefits, who doesn't? I mean, does the governor, because the governor's been on TV a lot, does he pick up some support because he is seen as a leader? Well, unlike Irma, that affected the entire state, this was really a strong, powerful, devastating storm, but it impacted a small section of the state. And frankly, I don't think it helps, you know, from a political standpoint, everywhere other than the affected area or that, that TV area in the panhandle. Most of uh, that area is probably going to lean toward Governor Scott anyway, anyway in, the, yeah. in the Senate race. So I don't, I don't think that this was a, a, a major impact or will have a major impact on this race. The one thing it did do is it probably turned off the race, basically simmered down the race for about a, a time out. Right. right. Well, for two the or debates three or four have been days. canceled this coming week. Right. There were debates that right. were off the books. Yeah, although, well, although HT, the um, there was every there were candidates there from every race looking for television time, and that's kind of some. It's uncomfortable because they're damned if they do, if they're damned if they don't. If, if they're not there, they're not doing their job. If they are there, they're looking for photo ops. Well, we need to stop for just a moment, and I'm sure I speak for everyone to say we extend our condolences to the families yes. Yes. of the 18 or 19 who died. I lived uh, through Hurricane Andrew in 1992, yeah. woke up, I could not recognize my community. That's right. what they're yes. seeing in Mexico beaches and places like that. Yes. Right. Also, our first responders, how proud should we yeah, be of we them? Are. No matter where there's a disaster, they're the there. first thing we know, Miami-Dade, Miami firefighters right. are there, yeah. saving Tamarack lives. And Davey Tamarack, absolutely. and absolutely, they're yeah. there. All these places. They elevate our humanity because they represent us. Now, with regard to the question that you asked, I was really proud of the fact that Governor Scott, uh, Mayor Gillum, and uh, Senator Nelson all stopped the politics and reached in and tried to help. Now, Andrew Gillum is my friend. I was really happy. He put on boots and gloves and, I, and a took chainsaw. On a chainsaw. <laughs> took on a chainsaw and, and actually went to work, right. not just providing leadership. But I, I must say I agree with Ed. I, I really, it always looks good to lead in times of trouble. Mm -hmm. But I think he's right as I thought about it, that it will probably just affect that area, which is already leaning towards Scott anyway. Yeah. Tony Mann, uh, Ron DeSantis continued. I mean, he did uh, help bring some relief supplies and did some work for the hurricane victims. But he continued his campaign and he also continued to run, or the Republican Party of Florida continued to run a really nasty attack ad against Gillum. Was that the right thing to do? or? Is that effective? You know, it's the kind of thing that we didn't see in the past, but we're in a different era in politics mm -hmm. now. And I'm not sure that voters in the rest of the state are going to be as concerned about uh, this as media elites and political elites are. From both sides of the aisle, I mean, there's been some, uh, some condemnation of DeSantis. But I'm not sure that people in South mm -hmm. Florida are going to be uh, upset or that turned off that uh, he continued doing that. What yeah. about Senator Nelson? I mean, he, I, I know he's at Tyndall Air Force Base today. Um, he has a role. He has What's displayed that? leadership. What role is that? Uh, that he, the role is he is a U.S. senator, just despite your party affiliations. I mean, here's a U.S. senator who is at the Air Force Base today. He's got a military background. He is not always as visible as the others. Is that an issue, that visibility? Well, set aside the hurricane. I don't mind him going to Air Force Base and doing an event there doing to try to figure out what happened to that Air Force Base, which was, by the way, devastated by it. That, but, that was the eye. But that was the, the eye, eye right? right? Yeah. But yeah. the real question about 
Senator Nelson is, you know, 30, 40 years of public service and nothing to show for it. So when you say he's not as visible, that's true. For 40 years, he's not as visible because he hasn't done anything. And that's essentially the reason why I think people are going to look to replace him come November. Well, you know, I was really happy because you have Republicans talking about the fact that here's a guy who is not exciting, hasn't done anything. I really love his new commercial where he talks about being strapped into a four and a half million ton rocket shot into space, people then remember this is an unsung, courageous hero who is humble about what he's done. He's not out there bragging. He's there to help and he's getting, doing help. Getting people a job is more important. I think Rick Scott's mm -hmm. record he runs on as governor far outseeds the fact that B uh, Bill Nelson once went to space, to be blunt, H.T. Well, Tony? Well, and in terms of the hurricane, yes. Senator Nelson is doing everything he should do as a, a U.S. senator and He's showing up at the scene. He's expressing his concern. Right. Uh, the same as Governor Scott is doing what he's supposed to right. be doing. Right. Well, and he is also saying to people who have small businesses that were destroyed, here's how you apply for loans. I mean, he, and by the way, he and Senator Rubio jointly have said, we've got to get Air, Tyndall Air Force Base back functioning because that the planes, the F-22s up there, are the key uh, air-to-air uh, fighter jet of the of the Air Force. Well, Tony they, said it just right. We have the, these people who are running for office who are doing what they can do and what they're supposed to do, whether it's the senator doing what he needs to do, the yeah. governor doing what he needs to do, yeah. or the mayor of Tallahassee doing what he needs to do. We need more of that. In office and running for office. Yes. Politics of Michael, more when we come right back. Stay tuned. Hurricane Michael. <laughs> Welcome back. We are in the midst of the round table with three real heavyweights here. Ed Pizzoli, no reference to your weight, Ed. Tony Moore, <laughs> H.T. Smith. Oh, oh boy. Oh, oh, boy. Oh, oh. No, no. Hey, I'm sorry. Oh. Don't take that personally. <laughs> well, let's, let's move on to a really serious subject, and that is the governor's race and appealing to the Jewish vote. It is extremely, I mean, 650,000 Jews live in Florida, roughly. A lot of them in South Florida. This morning, Tony, uh, Ron DeSantis 
or this afternoon, right about now, Ron DeSantis is at a synagogue out in Plantation, and you covered Andrew Gillum at a synagogue earlier this week. It really shows how important this is to both candidates. Uh, Gillum wanted to refute uh, suggestions, allegations from the DeSantis campaign that uh, he has people close to him who are anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. and uh, Including he, Chris King. Yes, and he came out very forcefully and talked about his long, long ties to the Jewish community. And Chris King has come on, ver yes. be been out very directly uh, refuting uh, questions raised about what he said uh, when he was at Harvard, ago. yeah, he, he, Harvard. he was on this program, in fact, and refuted it. Uh, yeah. I thought uh, pretty strongly. But, but you know, the, the Jewish community in South Florida, anywhere, it's not a monolithic vote right. by Absolutely. any stretch of the imagination. Absolutely. And HT, you, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I just want to say that what more convincingly for me uh, was uh, what Rabbi said about what Andrew Gillum did when he was a commissioner, working with the Jewish community to establish the sister. Uh, relationship between Tallahassee and a city in mm -hmm. Israel and how he's gone to Israel several times after that and worked with the, the Jewish community. <coughs> yeah, but, uh, Martin but Sanders has a very strong record on str Israel. I mean very strong, uh, un well. unflinching, right? So the, so the big issue for Andrew Gillum really comes down to who works, who has been surrounding him and their leanings toward, how would I say, uh, the Palestinian side of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I mean, Andrew Gillum was quoted in saying that when President Trump announced the move of the embassy to Jerusalem, that it was an unnecessary provocation. So unnecessary provocation to do, to move the embassy to Jerusalem uh, and do what every president since George Bush Sr. wanted to do, President Trump did, and then Andrew Gillum says, unnecessary provocation. I, well, you to know, me, a, lot, a lot of people, sort of spells actually, it out. a lot of people felt like that, that there mm -hmm. was a, a split of I that. I mean, I have Israeli concern. friends who, who felt it was but, but a look, provocation, but I know he said American not, policy, not the move, but the timing American of it. policy has been every president, including Obama, including Clinton, yeah. all, all said that the capital of the embassy belongs in Jerusalem. Right. And the so, bottom line is, is that, is that that is something where Andrew Gillum got waffly neat on, and the consideration is who's in his ear and why is he leaning well, uh, away from the state of Israel. Well, I, I'm not surprised at all by this dissenting tactic. You remember the day after Gillum secured the nomination, DeSantis said, let's not monkey this up. Then he said he's a radical. Then he said he's a socialist. Then he says anti-Israel. Now he's saying he's corrupt. I wouldn't All be right. surprised if he charged him raping children before the election. Oh, well, oh. Ho hold on, H.C. I th let me show, let's show the people at home a little bit of the ad that is running that I referred to earlier and Tony did as well. I mean, this, if we could run it, is really a, I think, kind of a vicious, I know, finding the line, what's appropriate, what's not, what goes over it. But this ad in which he says, uh, the uh, DeSantis campaign says, the FBI is after Gillum and that he is not just radical but also corrupt. Um, I mean, I think this, I frankly think this goes over the line. And the, I know the Gillum campaign wrote television stations like this one and said, you must take this off the air. Well, we have not taken it off the air, and no other station has taken it off the air either. Uh, uh, Ed, do you think that if, if there is the line, this goes past the no, line? No, no. This is something that, and this, frankly, if you speak to some of the Democratic opponents in the primary that Gillum beat, they're, they were upset that they didn't run some of this. So the idea that there's an invest, ongoing FBI investigation is just a, simply a fact. Um, he is not a subject. Uh, but he is intimately involved. He released records that were redacted poorly, frankly. They can't identify who paid him what money. He released, and so, he released some receipts, but so, not all but receipts. But they redacted them. And, and when you look at the redactions, they were done so poorly, you can sort of piece together some of it. And there's about a $20,000 to $40,000 issue about where some of that money came. And the Gillum campaign has refused to answer it. That's the first thing. Second thing, on, on the radical piece, you ask your friends who, and, your, and your viewing audience, in Venezuela and in Cuba, who come from those places, who understand the creep of what you would call socialistic policies, whether it's an increased taxing, a takeover of, of a the healthcare system, this moves oh, us to we're talking about socialism. Corruption. We're talking about well, corruption. that's what he's talking about. I'm, I'm dealing things, with the other piece of it. I agree with Ed that he's not a subject of the investigation. 
and he's not a target of investigation. There are only three categories. If you're not a target <coughs> subject, you're a witness, and that's what he is. Secondly, uh, police chiefs have uh, come on with a commercial saying that DeSantis' ad is, and they say, a lie. All Democrats. I believe All Democrats. Right. Well, let, hold on for a second, please. Um, I asked, <laughs> well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to run a soundbite from uh, Ron DeSantis. I asked him on Thursday, Friday of this week, rather, uh, does he stand by this ad? You'll hear his answer when we come back. I, I can guess. Continuing now, our roundtable live in the studio. And uh, before the break, I said I had spoken to Ron DeSantis on Friday when he received the uh, endorsement from the Broward Sheriff's Deputies Association, the union out there, 1,300 deputies, uh, endorsed him. And I asked him about this ad that we had just shown you a little bit of uh, that calls Andrew Gillum corrupt and under investigation. And here's what uh, Ron DeSantis had to say. Do you stand by that answer? Hundred uh, percent. The fact of the matter is, he went on these junkets. He did. He didn't pay for that. He claims he paid four hundred dollars to stay four nights in a luxury Costa Rica villa. Four hundred dollars cash. Now, I can't even stay in the Holiday Inn Express down the street for four nights for four hundred dollars. It doesn't even pass the laugh test. But the guy he supposedly paid, Adam Corey, has said that he never received any money for it. So he's not answered basic questions about this. All right, H.T., you are a Gillum supporter. On this program, four or five months ago, you said he was going to be the nominee. You support him. What, what would be your response to Mr. DeSantis? My response to Mr. DeSantis is this matter is under investigation and there's going to, by the FBI, and the FBI will do a full and fair investigation and reveal all of the facts to the people. Until then, just as we've heard from other political leaders, he's presumed innocent. He's not a subject, nor is he a target. Let's talk about the fact, the issues that are affecting the people of Florida. So you, you know what the, the problem is here is we're talking about commercials as if they are news reports. These right. are sell ads, and this campaign has been nasty. Tony, in, in news reports, the tone is much different. The facts are there. You've reported on it. 
And the context doesn't come through in ads oh, is one of the biggest things. And it really shows how nasty, as you said, this campaign has become and how polarized the public is. And there are appeals, uh, I think you could fairly say in the DeSantis ad, there are some you know, racial suggestions there. And uh, you know, it really is a, it, it's troubling about the way this, uh, this yeah. nastiness has evolved. Uh, we are a divided country. It's reflected in our politics. Um, let's move on if we can to can the I make penny one, text. Can I yeah. make one point before? Jump in. On, on, the, on that piece, though, if, if put aside, if it was Buddy, Buddy McKay when he ran, it was Buddy, you're a liberal. Yeah. And, it, and, you know, and part of some of that. And, and if someone was under a federal investigation or subject to it or, or there was a controversy around that person, that would always be something that a political opponent would always bring up, regardless of color or race. So let us not jump to that race card because normally in politics, all of those things are fair game. Well, I'm not sure who jumped to the race card first. Wait, uh, that's maybe, what I'm saying. Uh, maybe Congressman DeSantis did the day after the uh, primary. Certainly, that's what the Gillum people think. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they do. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to this penny tax proposal in Broward County and Tony Mann this morning. I know there's a firewall, people got to understand, a firewall between the editorial page and the newsroom. So you're not dancing to the tune set by our friend Rosemary O'Hara <laughs> uh, at the, the Sun Sentinel. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, do you think the votes are there to pass this in, in Broward? I think the votes probably are there to pass this in Broward. There are some tactical reasons. It was politically probably smart for them to put it on a, a, ball a general election ballot. It's probably Democrats. going to get a lot of uh, Democratic uh, excitement and Democratic turnout. And Broward is trending, has been trending since the time uh, Ed was uh, leading the Republican Party, has been going more and more Democratic. There is not an organized opposition to this referendum. Uh, you did, weren't able to have uh, opponents to it uh, with you in the interview just uh, earlier in the program mm -hmm. the way you normally would have yes, because there isn't an organized opposition to yeah. it. Yeah. I checked with the, uh, the Koch brothers sponsored Americans for Prosperity when they came out in favor of the Hill, came out against the Hillsborough County tax increase referendum right. and they have no plans to try that yeah. in Broward. Well, the opponent, the opponent, Ed Pizzoli, is the editorial page <laughs> of the Sun Sentinel. I mean, they rip apart this plan in this editorial I, today. I, I don't tend to agree with the Sun Sentinel editorial, but on this one I actually do. There are three things that bother me most. They say transportation is a priority. Broward County government spends $150 million on transportation according to their budget line item for this year. But that's a two point of a two point seven billion dollar budget, Michael. So if it's a priority, it's not reflected in the budget. First thing. Second thing is they're asking for thirty years. Right. Thirty years. Why not do five? We, we talked about this before we came on. Ht made a, Ht. I'll give Ht the absolute credit of it. Why not ask for five years? See how it goes, and then ask for additional time. The, the mayor actually answered that. Yeah, we, he yeah. said it's a long term. Yeah, project. but but they don't have a plan. So I think also think they should have waited for the MPO. The Metropolitan Planning Organization had a, a transportation, big, yeah. and they should have waited for that to tell yeah, The whole thing is they don't have a plan. Just take light rail. We know for a fact that light rail will get cars off the roadway. Mm -hmm. So where will the light rail go? We don't know. Uh, how much light rail? We don't know. We know buses will take it off. They say we're going to add 300 buses in 30 years. The first year they get $357 million of tax money. How much of that's going to be for buses? You know, every year they can tell us if they don't buy one bus, they can say, well, we promised in 30 years. Right. It's only 25 years now. Also, the, the system, the light rail system they're talking about would run on overhead lines. I mean, that seems like 19th century technology. Right? Yes. And, and that's, a, that's part of the problem. Um, but look, there's no organized opposition for the most part. It's likely to pass. The, the question I have ultimately is when they get all this money, how many how many spoons in the kind of the the ice cream jar they're going to be because you've got all those cities wanting to do improvements as well so you've got all of that mixed in well then you have it on a ballot that's in some municipalities oh 22 20 pages, pages. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah. but that that's what make people vote no yeah because they get to the end of the or not vote at all if it's at the end off. of the battle get tired I mean, midway through one other thing i want to hear i want to hear from my friend tony on this you got and that is seconds, so okay oversight fast. the oversight board we need a diversity of specialties we need people with transportation finance yeah. law right. engineering etc yeah. we're going to have all political lobbyists and, and, and people politically connected that's no oversight at all, all right. good point we're on it
good point on which to end. Thank you all very much. Great round table. As always. All right. Up, up next. next, will you vote <laughs> yes, no to raise your taxes? Will you vote to lower your taxes? Maybe you'll vote both because the sell on all of that is underway. A live look right now from our tower cams across South Florida on a beautiful day. It is indeed, and here is Weather Authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with our Sunday forecast. Brandon. Yeah, you know what? It doesn't look bad at all. Sitting at 83 degrees right now, you saw how there was just a few clouds in the sky. Rain chances fairly low, keeping it about 20% throughout the rest of this afternoon. I know we started out with some showers, especially in Miami-Dade. Broward County has been dry for a good chunk of today. So just a couple of showers around. Tonight, an isolated shower, but I think most of us are going to be dry. We'll drop down to the upper 70s and then back up to the upper 80s again for tomorrow. But look at those rain chances. Still a little bit below average. We have a little bit of moisture hanging around. The deeper the orange, the warmer the color, the more moisture we have. And much of the deeper moisture is going to stay to the south. So we have some waves of drier air moving in. So when you see the seven day forecast, look at those rain chances all the way across the board. Below average, not too bad of a forecast, guys. Looks good, Brandon. Thanks so much. We here are so grateful for the flood of feedback we received this week that were thank you notes from voters letting us know how helpful our little video tutorials were explaining the confusing ballot items on the state amendment, making simple and clear what may be baffling legalese. There is no better feedback a news organization can get. Those are all there for you on local10.com. And you've also communicated a number of questions about city-specific and county-specific ballot questions that also need scrutiny, especially because they ask you to raise taxes where elected leaders will not or cannot. On the very same ballot in November, where the state asks homeowners to lower taxes and even make it more difficult to increase them on that very same ballot, Local entities are asking you to tax yourselves more. In Miami-Dade, the school district wants you to raise your homeowner taxes so they can figure out how to give some more money to teachers. In Broward, they want you to raise the sales tax to pay for transportation projects. We talked all about that earlier. In Miami Beach, they want to raise money to bond big projects. 
there is some irony here. The entities telling you they need more of your money are collectively spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to sell you on it. And you may be seeing that in a flood of flyers, in staged town hall meetings with scripted talking points, in ads with catchy slogans and passionate appeals. And what's missing from all of that is balanced, factual, detailed information to help you make an informed choice. There is devil in the details. And then there are questions about w the way that leaders budget and spend the money that they already have now. Every ballot question has an upside and a downside and context. And without all of that, a voter is less informed. For the record, this is not meant to suggest how to vote on any of the taxing items. It is to suggest that the onslaught of materials branded as information can actually create an information deficit, and it's up to you and us here to find the simple and basic truth. And that is our program today. You can catch any of our programs on Local10.com. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. We are so glad you're here. and. Please go Dolphins. Also, subscribe to our Roundtable podcast online. You just saw the graphic. Stay tuned right now for SoFlo Health. It's right here and it's next.